Okay, so good evening and uh, welcome back uh, today to the next uh, lecture in the uh, series of uh, what is called All About Neutrinos, online interactive lecture series for general audience. And uh, as many of you who are online today uh, would know that these are being organized by the India-based Neutrino Observatory, a uh, short you know, project. And uh, this is also one of the mega science projects, which uh, along with ITER and other six projects have been, uh, you know, kind of uh, organized uh, uh, a year long uh, science expo, if I can say, uh, the recently, sometime 19, 2019 and 20. Uh, today we are going to have uh, a lecture titled Nuclear Fusion Towards a New Source of Energy by Professor Sushir, Shishir sorry, Deshpande from IPR uh, Gandhi Nagar. And once again, uh, you would again remember, we had a related talk, in fact, on ITER project, uh, early Jan by uh, the project director, Rujwal Parva. Uh, so it's nice to kind of have two uh, talks complementing the, uh, the, the technology and the physics of uh, ITER and uh, both of them happen to be the project directors at some stage or the other. And um, so let me take uh, a minute uh, to introduce today's speaker before we ask the speaker to start his lecture. Uh, Professor Shishir Deshpande did his master's in physics in 1984 and completed doctoral research in 1992 at the Institute of Plasma Research, IPR uh, at Ahmedabad. And after joining IPR as a faculty member in 93, he has contributed to fusion research in various roles. Uh, one, for example, leading a group for physics design of tokamak uh, that is during 1995 to 2007. And for fusion blanket design, which is of course the, one of the main parts of uh, the tokamak for during the 2006 and eight, and as a project director uh, for ITER India, that's what I mentioned, during 2007 and 19, uh, a mega science project for execution of in-kind deliveries from India to the, the ITER France, I mean, the, the location of the site where the ITER is being built as of now. Uh, he has published uh, over 40 scientific papers and is currently working at IPR as the head of fusion interdisciplinary science division. Uh, so, with these few words of introduction about today's speaker, uh, so it's over to Sushir uh, for today's lecture, exciting lecture, I must say, uh, on the ETA project. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Satyanarana. <clears throat> I hope I'm audible. Yes. And I thank you again for your kind words. Uh, so, I'll talk about nuclear fusion and how all this effort is going to take us to a source of energy which is new, which is safe, clean, and how much work still remains to be done in order to achieve this. So, okay. So let's um, let's uh, bring in uh, this very famous uh, person. Hans Bethe, and you already probably know how complete and thorough were his papers. In fact, people say like Chandrasekhar that the field started with introduction and it ended with his conclusion. He was known for his extraordinary thorough calculations and he, based on the <coughs> previous uh, conjectures and developments, proposed how the stars must be producing energy and proposed nuclear fusion to be the source of star fire. And he received a Nobel Prize for that in 1967. <clears throat> but uh, we must also uh, recall the extraordinarily dynamic and colorful physicist George Gamma, who actually explained how tunneling helps us in understanding a paradoxical situation where the Coulomb electrostatic repulsion between, let us say, two ions is actually overcome because this repulsion is 
too strong of the order of uh, an mev whereas uh, <clears throat> the energies of the uh, particles which are undergoing fusion can be of the order of kilo electron volts almost a 1000 or a few thousand of the barrier and so the quantum mechanics comes to the rescue uh, physics students know that very well and if the de broglie wavelength corresponding to the particles is uh, long enough and overlaps a significant portion of the barrier then there is a finite chance in fact gamma solved the other problem how does the alpha particle come out of the nucleus and uh, you can read a lot about it and in fact the nucleus actually forms a very strong barrier uh, for alpha to come out and it takes a very large number of attempts <clears throat> to come out so one can see how you know different uh, nuclei offer different types of resistance to the escape of alpha and one can then see how uh, this tunneling explained the other side that is the incoming protons or deuterons or deuteron and tritium triton uh, interacting and creating a fusion reaction uh, gamma did not receive a nobel prize but he was very much uh, you know appreciated and known in his circles so <clears throat> at the energies of interest the atoms are in an ionized state and so to overcome this barrier uh, it's not possible classically and so in short the tunneling is the only solution and of course uh, we all know about the binding energy curve uh, <clears throat> as to what happens when particles actually mix so <clears throat> i hope you can see this clearly you can see the mass number on the x axis and the binding energy per nucleon in mega electron volts on the y axis and you can see that it rises up uh, for the low uh, atomic number nuclei and then more or less reaches a peak at iron and then starts coming down <clears throat> now what you can see is that uh, this fusion process can go all the way up to iron because as you fuse you are getting energy it is coming out to be an exothermic reaction all the way up to iron and in fact you know this very well and uh, in in fact fusion is so common in astrophysics and it's used extensively you can see <clears throat> for example this very nice chart where you can see most of the periodic table contributed by one or the other astrophysical processes except uh, you can say hydrogen uh, and of course the heavy hydrogen came out of the big bang but after that uh, uh, we should uh, truly thank the neutron stars especially the merging neutron star for all the gold and the silver that is around us and uh, for the exploding massive stars <clears throat> for the silicon and germanium that we use in mobiles etc and uh, of course uranium for the nuclear energy and carbon comes out of the dying low mass stars so actually the universe is made up of fusion 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 everywhere except uh, the other nucleosynthesis which proceeds beyond iron by <clears throat> neutron capture but that's also some type of fusion so fusion is everywhere and so is plasma uh, so if we look at a whole lot of materials and matter around us we will see examples of plasma ranging from uh, a huge you know 30 orders of magnitude number density uh, and almost 6 uh, or 7 orders of magnitude in temperature and plasma is truly the widest and farthest uh, reaching state of matter uh, it actually Uh, you can associate uh, you know plasma techniques to even the electrons in metals or you know pro uh, the progress of a projectile in <clears throat> a solid an iron traveling in a solid for example or for example the extremely dense matter within the neutron stars and just uh, as a quick um, detour uh, dr satyanarayana mentioned neutrinos 
uh, you know how fusion and neutrino uh, are connected, uh, especially in a neutron star, because when the matter gets extremely, extremely dense, only the neutrinos can cool that star rapidly enough for progressive compression. So it's actually all the more appropriate that we're talking about fusion in the INO forum. So at the top center, you will see the magnetic confinement fusion. We'll be encountering this again uh, a little more slides down the line. You can see on the top right, the solar core, which is close to 10 raised to seven Kelvin and an extraordinary density of 10 raised to 28 or 27 particles per meter cube. In fact, it is almost 150 <clears throat> grams per cc, an extremely dense thing. Uh, so what is plasma? Uh, it's first of all, an extraordinarily ubiquitous uh, state of matter. And here being charged, it has uh, a direct electromagnetic connection between particles unlike a neutral gas, where at best the Van der Waals forces come into picture when they get too close to each other. But these are electromagnetic forces like Coulomb interactions have infinite range. And although plasma may have some shielding, the particles are constantly in touch with each other via electromagnetic forces. So let us uh, take another look at the same chart, but with an upside and uh, you know, rotated thing. It's temperature on the x-axis here and density on the y-axis. And here you see a slightly different, more physics picture of, uh, of this uh, plasma. So you can see the fusion reactor appearing at log four, which means 10 raised to four you know, order, order of 10 to four electron volts. We measure plasma temperatures in electron volts, which is convenient. Uh, an electron volt is roughly 10,000 Kelvin. So <clears throat> it's a 10 to eight Kelvin uh, system there. And uh, on the left, uh, most side, you will see a very uh, low uh, temperature Earth's ionosphere and density about say <clears throat> 10 raised to five. And this plasma plays a role and played a role in the reflection of the radio waves, uh, which allowed the radio waves to propagate around the earth. Uh, we are familiar with solar corona, which is around uh, 10 raised to two EV. That's about hundred EV, which is routinely produced in, uh, let us say, fusion devices, and uh, but the density is uh, 10 raised to 10 uh, per centimeter. And the solar corona discharges and the coronal mass ejections can actually put out the whole electricity grid on Earth. They can be such strong storms. The low pressure uh, and other discharges are common. You can see from the neon, uh, signs, high pressure arcs are again uh, common for weldings or plasma pyrolysis. Shock tubes and jet pinches are again used for pulsed neutron uh, sources. Laser plasmas produce a very exciting medium for plasma physics, uh, especially you can see the pursuit at TIFR using the chirping technology where they have produced extreme density, uh, power density on material and produced plasmas and effects of that kind. Uh, focus is, uh, dense plasma focus is another interesting system uh, where neutrons are produced and it is pursued at uh, Center for Plasma Physics Guwahati in India and elsewhere too. <clears throat> so there is, uh, you know, a combination of uh, material engineering, science, and all kinds of physics disciplines integrate into plasma, including astrophysics. <clears throat> so what are the fusion reactions uh, that we are looking at? So <clears throat> the DT fusion is what we will be talking about. I have highlighted that here. But uh, uh, even when we do uh, a DT fusion uh, being a distribution of particles, 
the deuterium deuterium fusion also occurs uh, which releases a proton and a neutron as you can see uh, the reaction 1a and 1b and in fact t t fusion also happens which is producing a helium 4 and two neutrons <clears throat> so uh, if we were really looking at uh, neutron spectrum of a fusion reactor we will see these various types of neutrons protons and various contributions from different reactions here is a uh, exhaustive list but uh, uh, do recall uh, reaction number nine, which is proton boron 11 fusion, which is uh, called the aneutronic fusion, basically a, a reaction which does not produce neutron of great interest because such reactions or such outcomes are uh, free from uh, radioactive emission. Uh, interestingly, there is uh, there are few reactions here uh, which uh, relate to a stripping reaction, uh, which comes, uh, which is not listed here, but which also produce uh, neutrons of high energy and are being used for testing the uh, materials for fusion. So <clears throat> fusion reactions in laboratory, uh, which are based on uh, various possible reactions and the feasibility, uh, we can converge on deuterium and tritium. So deuterium has one proton and one neutron uh, uh, produced mostly during the Big Bang. Tritium has one proton and two neutrons and has to be produced more or less on the fly because it doesn't last. And the reaction is uh, D plus T, which results in an alpha particle and a neutron. The alpha particle is basically the helium nucleus, which is two protons and two neutrons. So let us look at uh, what is going on when they fuse. Light nuclei can combine <clears throat> to form a heavier nucleus and the delta M C square is released as energy that you know. So if we look at the DT and normalize that by the proton mass, uh, notice that the deuterium is short by 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.00994 uh, a fraction of the proton. Tritium is down by 006284, which shows that the D and T are having themselves a little bit less mass compared to two and three because they are themselves a result of some kind of a fusion. Okay, now we are going to unwind that and we're going to spend that energy. So that number is going to come on the right hand side. On the alpha, you can see we gain a good deal of uh, binding energy. You can see the graph there. The helium is the low and the bar is uh, really high there. And neutron. <clears throat> uh, so the net uh, that we see is about 2%, 0 0.02 is 2% of the proton mass. So the energy that is released is roughly 2% of the proton mass, which is 17.6. MeV. So that was about DT fusion and to be exact, the mass deficit is 0 0.01875 proton masses, which is about 2.8 and this to minus 12 joules. That means in every reaction, one is going to liberate 17.6 mega electron volts, uh, which I call EF or fusion energy. And uh, the we must also do the momentum balance. And so the, the original energies and moment are obviously too small. Uh, so the 17.6 MeV energy, when it is distributed, uh, should be distributed in such a way that, you know, the mass of the, I mean, the momentum of the alpha and the moment of the neutron must more or less balance. And so if you plug in, you know, energy of the alpha, which is 14.1 uh, neutron, uh, sorry, energy of the alpha 3.5 plus energy of the neutron equal to fusion, then the sharing comes out to be four is to one. And therefore <clears throat> alpha carries away about a fifth of the total energy and neutron takes about uh, four fifth of the remaining energy. So 3.5 MeV alpha and 14.1 MeV neutron. So the final uh, distribution of energy is actually done by the momentum balance. 
<clears throat> uh, just uh, to catch up some basics, uh, I'm sure you know already about it. But uh, imagine a beam of uh, projectile particles entering a zone uh, which is randomly filled with target particles. And if the target particles present a very tiny area, then the beam just goes through uh, with negligible scattering. But if the target presents a large area, then the beam would scatter completely. So quantitatively, one can consider a cylindrical zone, let us say with a unit cross-section area and some length. And as the projectile travels inside that zone, its chances of collision go on increasing because some or the other scatter is going to meet it as you penetrate deeper and deeper. So a stage comes when at a certain L, it will most probably collide. Now, when you take mean lengths over many particles, that's the mean free path. And you can associate also a cross section for collisions, uh, depending on the kind of reaction. Sometimes it can be scattering, it can be merging, it can be an excitation and a de-excitation, just a gamma emission, for example. So there can be all kinds of uh, reaction cross-sections. And this uh, by itself is a very deep, well-known and well-researched nuclear field uh, with various expertise in India as well as abroad. And large number of nuclear data are available by IAEA side. And there are gaps also clearly shown which data needs to be generated more so that we have greater and greater predictability in uh, our projections. <clears throat> so here is a picture of the cross section. Uh, it is in 10 raised to minus or two, two or three 10 raised to minus 28 meters square. Uh, and uh, you can see the DD cross section, you know, far outperforms the I mean, DT cross-section outperforms the DD cross-section almost by a factor of 100 or so. And uh, this interesting reaction, DHE3, which is also popularly uh, seen in, in literature, which is the deuterium helium-3 fusion, uh, which is a neutronic fusion, <coughs> is, uh, is, is, it does very well at around three to 400 keV. But uh, at these energies, uh, one can actually show that the Ramstrahlung and the synchrotron radiations are so dominant uh, that um, it almost starts becoming a, a defeating exercise. However, um, it, it might interest you uh, to know that the helium-3 has an excellent cross-section a truly excellent cross-section for capture of a slow neutron to convert back into tritium. So, uh, although uh, you know tritium goes back to helium every now and then, the there is an interesting reaction there, and hence uh, people talk about Moon's helium-3 mining, which is probably very rich in the helium-3 deposits, as another probable you know, a futuristic area of work. Uh, <clears throat> the discovery of uh, uh, deuterium, heavy hydrogen, uh, came uh, from Harold Urey, 1934 Chemistry Nobel Prize. <clears throat> you might like to remember this. And uh, so coming back to fuel, the deuterium is basically deuteros, it's two particles, triton, triton is tritos, three particles in Greek. And uh, it's abundant, deuterium as 0.02 atom percent of hydrogen in the oceans, which is a, a very huge number. Tritium was detected in uh, 1934 in the DD reactions and is rare and radioactive isotope of hydrogen. It converts into uh, helium-3, emits a beta ray of 5.7 keV with an electron antineutrino. So this conversion is basically a decay which automatically happens over about 12 years. And so tritium needs to be constantly 
produced. It does get produced in plenty in the heavy water reactions, reactors where uh, one uses deuterium or deuterated water for moderating or controlling the spectrum of neutrons. And as a result, the uh, outgoing water contains a significant tritium. It then needs to be separated out and therefore it can become a good starting point for fusion reactors. <clears throat> now, the tritium which is getting consumed uh, is an expensive and prime commodity and we must find a way of regenerating it. And luckily there is an interesting reaction there. Uh, so you can see uh, that <clears throat> there is a significant lithium available, 25 milligrams per kg in Earth's crust and about 0.2 ppm of seawater. So it goes into the billions of tons of lithium. And lithium, as you know, is very commonly used in the lithium batteries uh, and with some <clears throat> specific medical applications. There are two reactions which can be extremely helpful to us. One is the natural lithium and 7 Li reaction, which consumes energy. That's the red in the 2.5 MeV. It gives us a tritium and alpha, but it takes energy. And it's possible. The exothermic reaction on N plus 6 Li uh, gives us 4.8 MeV. Now, if we just take the lithium as it is from Earth's crust, uh, it would contain 92.5% of Li7. So one may need to enrich it if required. But <clears throat> there are several studies and uh, of course there is a whole, you know, you can say the whole world is after lithium because of the important properties of um, storage cells and batteries. And huge deposits of lithium <clears throat> are there in Bolivia and so many other places. So, uh, one of the interesting things that emerges is one will need lithium mining for generation of uh, lithium, some enrichment if required for generation of tritium. Now, how do we get back the tritium? Every triton that was burnt generates a neutron and the neutron is not going to be captured easily in the, in the thin plasmas produced in the laboratories. So there has to be a vessel, but before it hits the vessel, a blanket containing lithium can do the job. Then the neutron interacting with the lithium will not only generate tritium, but it will also deposit the heat, which is 14.1 MeV into the blanket. And that heat we should tap for driving turbines. So <clears throat> now with that uh, done, uh, we need to see how do we actually implement this entire thing. So thermonuclear fusion uh, is a way. Thermonuclear means we create plasma of a hot uh, or high temperature and expect the particles to collide with each other and their chance collisions will result in fusion. We just have to have them enough dense so that there are enough number of collisions and we must have it enough high temperature so that the Coulomb barrier can be significantly climbed and the tunneling probability is high. Now the particles obey a distribution which you know is a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution uh, or Gauss-like distribution based on the temperature. Higher the temperature, wider is the distribution. Scattering will be the most probable outcome because that's the event that happens most often. But every now and then, based on the cross-section for the fusion reactions, reactions do occur. And although the occurrence is rare, the energy release is very substantial. Now, uh, let me contrast this with the inertial confinement fusion, which I'm not covering here, but uh, there, uh, one is irradiating a small frozen pellet of deuterium tritium uh, by intense lasers. And 
what happens broadly is that the laser ablates the outer layers of the DT pellet. So the, the spherical shell suddenly ablates, giving the remaining pellet a kick inwards, causing the densities to become even more than solid, reaching thousand times that of solid density. And therefore, with such densities and high temperatures, a pulse of fusion can be created and has been demonstrated. But this by itself is a very exciting topic and probably another talk by some other expert. So I will now come back to thermonuclear fusion because that's the line we want to develop today. So to confine a hot plasma in a laboratory experiment, uh, one must make use of magnetic forces because uh, large uh, gravitational forces are possible only uh, on the large scale and that's possible only in the stars. Now, charged particles gyrate in circular orbits in magnetic field. You know that already. So Q, V perpendicular cross B, a vector cross product is the force. This force is clearly perpendicular to the magnetic field and uh, therefore the particles just gyrate around the field line. If they have a parallel velocity to begin with, this velocity will continue uh, to be unaffected. So you can expect a helical path of a charged particle in general. Of course, the field itself can be very curved and we can have more complex motions, but for a straight field, for a homogeneous field, we can say that uh, helical paths are, are probably the best representations of the particle orbits. Uh, to comprehend this whole thing, we can consider a one kilo electron volt deuteron moving in one Tesla magnetic field. Its velocity would be uh, 2.2 10 raised to seven in centimeters. And its gyro frequency, which means its angular velocity, the time uh, it takes to complete one rotation, uh, 6.8 and to 7 radians per second. So the ratio of velocity to angular velocity is radius and that would come to around 3 millimeters. So you can see how tiny these things can be. A proton would gyrate in 3 point. Now, uh, clearly you can quickly extrapolate that an electron would have even shorter radius because for the same energy, uh, the gyro radius is <clears throat> proportional to the square root of mass. So particles, however, can flow freely along the magnetic field lines. And so if we can tie the field lines in a circle, then the particles would, although they would orbit around the field lines, they would go and complete one full loop. So a particle, a line biting its own tail, for example. Uh, this is a bit uh, oversimplification, uh, but it broadly tells you the story that the particles is like a, a sliding of a bead on a wire. So what is a, what is a geometry which has confined magnetic field lines? And there are uh, interesting mathematical theorems also, which you can read and mathematics oriented people can see them. So the best solution is actually a torus with a major radius, let us say R and minor radius A. That's how you describe a torus. And the field lines go around the torus uh, along the major radius as well as minor radius and they weave a helix. Uh, it's also somewhat deeply mathematical stuff. And a torus topology is a, a very elegant solution where uh, field lines do not have to go to infinity and therefore particles do not have to go to infinity as they slide along. So the only thing that would happen then is that if the magnetic field is not uniform, the circles that the particles are making around the field line will also not remain circles. They will have small drifts because the radius of curvature would change as the particle gyrates. All this results in a slow drift of the particles. And it is this drift, which if it's uncontrolled, 
will again cause the plasma to be lost to the walls. And that is easily controlled by giving the field line themselves a helical power. First of all, the particles move helically. And if we can make the field lines also go helical by a combination of external magnetic fields, the problem is pretty much under control as far as the particle picture is concerned. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> let's take another level uh, as to why uh, we must look at the fluid picture. Uh, the plasma is also a fluid and it induces currents and charges as the particles move in groups, which can be substantial. In fact, plasma's own fields can influence itself. A, a channel of current can undergo a pinch effect by its own magnetic field. So such instabilities can arise in plasmas. And therefore, uh, one has to look at not only the particle picture, but the fluid picture. And <clears throat> there are now two directions here when we talk about the helical field, the tokamak, which we will discuss shortly, and stellarator, which is also a toroidal device. But the big difference between the two is the need of a plasma current. Whereas tokamaks need the plasma current, the stellarators do not. An example of a stellarator would be, let us say, Wendelstein X stellarator, which is currently being commissioned. And you can see uh, using uh, websites all the details of how they have uh, brought up the plasma, what are the problems stellarators struggle with, and how complex are those geometries. So, uh, there are lots of studies on tokamaks because for the past, say, 60, 50 to 60 years, a large number of tokamaks have contributed to the rapid growth of the database on tokamaks and have definitely taken a lead and are now moving towards the real fusion reactor. And one day we might see these helical and stellarator devices too, but right now, <clears throat> Tokamak takes the lead. So now when we discuss the behavior of the plasma, what is important is to understand what kind of a time scale we are referring to. Electrons are light, ions are heavy. So all rapid responses come from electrons. And if we want to elicit a response from ions, then the electrons obviously are able to do so because they are anyway too fast. So in that case, the electrons and ions more or less move together. In fact, there is a time scale where the magnetic field and the plasma move together. And that is called the magnetohydrodynamics. And that is one of the most dominating, you know, phenomenology we will see uh, in everywhere, in plasmas, in astrophysics, in tokamaks, everywhere. So it is one of the most important because it deals with the plasma as a whole. If there is an instability, the entire plasma uh, can disappear due to magnetohydrodynamic instability. So stabilization of MHD instabilities becomes a prime objective in any device. It's almost like the life of the plasma. Once you have stabilized that, the other things may arise, but that's something of a secondary problem. So <clears throat> coming back to plasmas, we need to note that the very act of confining the plasma throws it out of the thermodynamic equilibrium. And hence, uh, you know, the plasma devises various ways to reach back to equilibrium. Uh, it has a very large uh, ways of doing that. It, has, it supports various types of waves. Those waves can be unstable. And uh, the plasma's whole idea is to have a uniform density and so spread everywhere, therefore escape confinement. And so since there are gradients of pressure, temperature, current, magnetic field, and so on, they are all sources of free energy. 
they are called expansion three energies. And these three energies can be tapped by the right kind of waves. If there is a good collaboration between the wave wavelength and uh, <clears throat> its, uh, its uh, frequency and the gradient scale lengths, then the waves can start draining this energy quite generously. And not only in their own ways, but they can couple uh, to each other too. So it is of a great importance to ask you know, how dense and how hot the plasma should be and how long should one be able to hold it uh, so as to have any meaningful energy output because uh, like any other fluid, the energy that we are putting into it is constantly traveling, transporting away towards boundaries and disappearing into a sink. So before that energy disappears into the sink, which is let us say the vessel or some such tiles, material tiles, uh, we must achieve fusion and that too in copious numbers. So before we get into detail, let's take an illustrative example. A plasma of temperature 30 keV and a deuterium tritium particle density of 10 raised to 20 per meter cube. So on the left hand side, you will see a sigma V, uh, it's different from sigma. You notice its units are also meter cube per second. And that's basically the product of uh, cross section and the velocity in the center of mass frame of the particles. And the angular brackets uh, indicate averaging over the uh, Maxwell distribution. So at 30 keV, uh, this reaction rate you can see is close to 7, 10 raised to minus 22. And so if the density was 10 raised to 20, then we would be getting 7, 10 to the 18 reactions per second, uh, which is kind of 7% uh, of the particles present in that meter cube. And we would get an amazing number there of 20 megawatt per meter cube. Now, so let's imagine a cube of volume one meter cube. And let us ask what is our investment there? Now to heat particles to 30 keV uh, and both deuterium and tritium and D plus NT. So three by two plus three by two, that makes it three NKT. Uh, here, remember that I am using KT, so this temperature is not in electron volts. And, but all the same, it would mean about 1.5 megajoules of heat uh, per cubic meter. That would be the investment to get the plasma to get to that temperature. The energy output in a second, which is basically just the power, is 20 megajoules. We just saw 20 megawatt, which means 20 megajoules are released per second. Out of that 20%, uh, which is basically four megajoules of alpha particles are charged particles. And so if we had a magnetic plasma, magnetic field, they would remain trapped within that field and probably deliver all their energy back to the plasma. So plasma is able to self heat if we can trap the alphas. With neutrons, we can't say so, but neutrons would disappear into the blanket and we need them there to carry out the power for further generation of electricity. Now, let's look at left side again. The heat is constantly being transported across the system towards its boundaries. That's the key point. Transport is one of the most important problems in physics of systems and in plasma, <clears throat> we can think of a criteria where NT, which is the energy density per meter cube, upon tau, which is the confinement time in seconds. So energy density upon confinement time is like the power density. And if we look at the PF, the power density uh, upon five, that's basically the alpha particles. So if we say that, let me balance 
the heat given back to the plasma by the alpha with whatever is transported by the transport processes. And if I can hit that balance, then you know we are in good shape. So if we then look at the nuclear physics of deuterium tritium reactions and look at that curve, which we saw a few minutes before, uh, which is sigma v, it can be well approximated by simple expression eight times n square t square in kilowatt per meter cube. And this n bold face with an underline is in units of 10 to 20. And T again bold face underline is measured in units of kilo electron volts. So a basic condition, a criteria for ignition would be the N T tau greater than 40. So let's put some numbers there. If N is one, and T is one, obviously this will not going to work because we, we don't have the right uh, temperature range to be satisfied by the sigma V. We have to have a energy at least six or seven or eight. So if we take 10 keV and N is equal to one, then tau must exceed four, four seconds. Now, this is a very tall order because the confinement time is truly, truly small in small devices. Unless we go on building bigger devices, this tau is a tough thing. We need that number to be as high as possible because then it brings down the requirement for putting energy to lesser and lesser values. And it improves the economy of and the return on investment. So, Greater confinement time is good. So let us look at tokamax, which is basically a, a magnetic bottle to hold the plasma. And so I'll take an excerpt from Boris Kadomsev's 1988 paper, uh, which is uh, pretty long back in time, and you can see I shall start with a very well-known information. The tokamak was born in USSR. That is uh, Sakharov and Tam. The first tokamak was constructed in 1955 and it was a top secret. And it was only you know, uh, revealed in 1962, 67, this Geneva conference. So tokamaks evolved and the first international display was at Novosibirsk, which led to the explosion of the family of tokamaks. And uh, <clears throat> this is a cartoon. Uh, interestingly, this was a time when both US and the USSR were pursuing fusion in their own way. And while the USSR was working on tokamaks, the US was working on stellarators. And that is how I had introduced that word stellarators. After the demonstration uh, at the conference and subsequent work, the US, uh, also join very strongly the path of tokamaks. So uh, to imagine a tokamak, you can think of a donut or a, or a tire, a tube with major minor radius. The rings around it are the toroidal field coils, which produce the magnetic field. And uh, on the right hand side, you will see a 1992 publishing IOP by Boris Kadomsev tokamak plasma, a complex physical system. And uh, <clears throat> uh, he pointed out a number of interesting relations on how one can achieve fusion. And one of the simplest one was that after a lot of uh, analysis, if the product of the minor radius and the toroidal field is of the order of 10, then we can achieve uh, required critical fusion. That is how it came out. So A, B, of the order of 10 or greater than 10. But we will come to that a little bit later. <clears throat> so here is a picture of uh, uh, Dr. Kadomsev explained Romanovsky uh, way back in uh, uh, days of TM3, the early tokamaks of 70s, uh, explaining how probably the confinement time, we, don't, we have no idea what they must be talking about. We, we can guess that uh, the the y-axis uh, they are expressing the huge uh, uh, transport 
effect at confinement time. On the left hand side, you can see 1 by tau 0 is equal to d by a square, which is the diffusion coefficient and the minor radius. So it's an inverse time, transport time. On the right hand side, you will see a picture uh, which belongs to 2000 uh, uh, of the order of uh, those period where uh, a large number of tokamaks have contributed database on tau, which is a confinement time. On the x-axis is a theoretical database projection coming from regression analysis uh, with a certain root mean square error and certain choices made uh, on the data. On the y-axis, you will see the experimental confinement time. <clears throat> and you can see a very tiny tokamak called start contributing at the lowest end, whereas on the right-hand side, you will see a tokamak called JET, Joint European Taurus, where the confinement time has reached almost on the order of a, of a second. Uh, so this tells us that the behavior of the plasma has a certain internal consistency, regardless of the size. There is some kind of a profile consistency the plasma wants to obey. And as long as you play with plasma by the rules set by the plasma, then you can almost get there. So by using these predictions, you can see almost four seconds as the ITER's confinement time. ITER is a large tokamak, which is basically a fusion reactor. <clears throat> now here is a quick look at the old uh, 1971 plasma, uh, T4 on the, on the top left, you will see the current profile evolving as a function of time. Uh, below that is the soft X-ray profile, the SXR stands for soft X-ray, because a lot of electrons undergo uh, Bremsstrahlung or stopping radiation on the impurity ions, on the ions and otherwise, and they emit uh, a soft in the soft X-ray range. And at the bottom, you will see neutron emission <clears throat> in arbitrary units. On the right hand side, you will see the picture over the years of the neutron production. It, it now has gone up by, let us say, almost 12 orders of magnitude. So steadily, the tokamak geometry over many devices has made progress in putting DD or equivalent DT or other reactions and achieved a neutron yield that has been constantly increasing. Okay. Uh, before uh, we get into uh, ether and other things, it is important to see uh, the previously built tokamak uh, in 1989 by India uh, called Aditya has been upgraded and has actually now gone beyond its you know, design values. It has reached its uh, plasma current, its magnetic field and its pulse limits either at the design value or beyond the design value. So here, a very interesting research goes on as to why and how the plasma interacts with the uh, walls, specific tiles of the vessel and what kind of radiation it emits and what would happen to plasma as a result. Will the plasma extinguish? Will there be erosion of the tiles? How does a hot plasma interact with uh, metal wall or graphite wall or molybdenum wall? Is a very exciting area of research and especially from the reactor's point of view. So <clears throat> uh, I have not covered the other tokamak here because we don't have time for that. So there exists a long history of fusion research worldwide. And there are a number of achievements uh, which have created a basis for ITER. So if we look at the uh, 1994 summary of the IAEA conference, <clears throat> we will see that uh, uh, there is a report on the production of fusion power by a tokamak fusion test reactor. Then, uh, you will see how this was produced. You can see 
in December, uh, November, May 1994, how different pulses were produced, how long did these pulses last, and how much power was produced. So you can see the 10.7 megawatt of fusion power has been produced, but look at the investment. It is 39.5 megawatt of input power, which means that in those days and in those configurations, one needs more power to be put in initially to get this 10 megawatt. Of course, if the temperature <clears throat> changes even a little bit, this fusion power would go uh, through the roof, but this is a clear demonstration of these early attempts in 1994-95. Uh, followed by TFTR came the Joint European Taurus in UK, which is a multinational collaboration and which fired several DT pulses. And you can see this November 9th, November 1991 news break at 7.44 p.m. today, 1.5 megawatts of power was produced. And of course, uh, you can see how it went up. So in 1997, they went for a long shot, which means a few seconds and the highest shot of uh, 15 or 16 megawatt lasted for about two seconds. So there is a <clears throat> clear demonstration of fusion power in tokamaks provided we have a reasonably large size and a reasonably large temperature. So the creation of ITER actually has a history in the Reykjavik summit um, between Gorbachev and Reagan, and there they agreed to pursue this path. And of course, then there was a joint implementation meeting in 2001, Toronto, and then various people joined. And a part of this, you might already know from your previous uh, lecture, if you have heard Ujwal before. So the goal of the ITER project is to demonstrate the generation of fusion energy using tokamak device. And uh, <clears throat> actually ITER needs to simultaneously achieve these uh, uh, say seven <clears throat> targets. So we can try to understand a little bit uh, beginning from the bottom right. The plasma purity, which means plasma wall interactions should not create so many impurities that the fraction of the fuel you know, drops below 0.7. The generation of metallic impurities or other impurities will create radiation. If the radiation is exceeding a large number, again, uh, we will have problems. So one should keep that radiation below 0.56 or so. The NE by N green wall is just a limit, a density limit. If we continuously increase density, the plasma disrupts. So this theoretical limit, at least 83%, one should be able to get there. The HHY2 is representing <clears throat> how much of an increased confinement time you can have. If you can achieve a good confinement factor over and above what you have, <clears throat> above the order of 1.3, if we can have a high normalized pressure, 2.5, if we can have a self-driven plasma current, which is 50%, then we will have achieved the physics objectives of ITER and achieved a certain flexibility in obtaining <clears throat> greater and greater fusion power. Now to do that, ITER will conduct a number of experiments and it has to be built in a certain way, but it is so complex and large that no single party could have built it uh, in a short time. It required a collaboration. Even just the superconductor produced for its magnets is produced in six different countries and different people around the world share parts of ITER. So uh, there are seven members and the, sh the host party is the Europe, which contributes about 45% of its cost. ITER is built by in-kind components and this is a picture of the ITER building as of November, 2020. You can see the ITER uh, complex, which is basically where the tokamak and its systems will be housed. And behind that, equally tall, is the assembly building. 
where the parts of eater come in, they get pre-assembled and then they are taken into the deep well where uh, there is a lot of concrete uh, in some, let us say, formation of a well, which prevents the radiation from coming out. So who manufactures what is already well known, well uh, described in the past, but you can notice uh, a certain contributions like the magnets are made by Japan, that is the conductor is supplied by Japan and manufacturing is done by US. And uh, let us say the cryostat, which is the outer vessel of the entire tokamak is built by India. Uh, blankets are built by four different partners, but ITER is not a breeding, tritium breeding blanket is not there in ITER. There are trial blankets, but most of the blankets of ITER are normal shield blankets. And only when it is proven, one will connect breeding blankets and connect that to an electricity production system. So what is India's contribution? So India has a dedicated body called ITER India, which works in IPR and is committed for executing the work for India's in-kind deliveries. And we have a number of deliveries uh, nearing completion. To understand India's role, we can ask uh, these four questions on the left, which are sort of simple to understand. Like how does one heat the plasma to heat, reach the fusion temperatures? So India is providing ion cyclotron resonance heating system. It is providing the sources and the power supplies. How does one shield the exterior from the harmful radiation? For that, India is supplying the involved shielding, which is a special tiles made of borated steel. How does one ensure that the magnets remain superconducting? So one must keep them cool by using cryogenic supply network. And one must cover that whole thing in a vacuum jacket. Otherwise, the air which surrounds the magnets itself becomes a good conductor of heat. So we have to put them in a like a vacuum flask. That's the cryostat. And where does the extracted heat go? So the cooling water systems from India remove the heat from the hot components of ether. And that's the normal water system, not the primary system. And reject it to environment using either cooling towers or uh, air cooled chillers. So that's how one can break up and therefore look at the specific nine packages of ITER India. I will not go into that because they have been very well covered, but suffice it to say that um, there is a lot of progress in their deliveries. So <clears throat> I will just show you uh, a few things here. Uh, I will not cover these interesting packages where there is R&D, which has already reached their milestone. So I will not cover the four packages below. And so if we look at the cryostat, which is the outer vacuum jacket, uh, it has been delivered. Its sections have been uh, installed. Only the top lid and one section is remaining to be installed because other things have to go in. For making such a giant a system, one had to make it in smaller parts in India, then ship them at either site and again sub-assemble them into slightly bigger parts and then they will be installed into ITER. And it is such a fabulous thing to see of all the collaboration and interesting YouTube videos there. The involved shields are very specific things. You have to cut a very specialized steel into very precise shape, make blocks out of that and fill those blocks in the gap between the two shells of the vessel. This package too has nearly completed. I had mentioned the cryogenic supply lines where India designed uh, the, the systems, manufactured the systems and supplied them and installation is in progress. 
so this this idea is to tell you that a large number of engineers and a variety of disciplines are involved uh, right from design analysis manufacturing uh, then control systems and so on quality and all these packages are gigantic packages i mean the pipes don't run into meters they run into thousands of meters and so making them to precision and then installing them at a foreign location under foreign regulation is a challenge so with that let us come to energy we already know that there are there is a limit on resources and there is a global quest and we are committed to the sdgs and the 17 sustainable development goals and you are encouraged to see this absolutely fabulous article by professor kao the founder director of ipr and uh, it's available on google where he demolishes the three fundamental assumptions which bring lethargy to the development of fusion one of them is for example we are comfortable we have enough energy we don't need to so that is destroyed next is is to expensive who is going to buy it that too is destroyed and third is why don't we wait for perfection for another 50 years maybe it will become better and then we will join this bandwagon and so an extraordinarily systematic analysis can be seen in this artisimovich memorial lecture so now look at that time which is 1992 and this goals of 2020 so we are talking about some 20 28 years later all these points are covered in his as well as past pieces lecture 1992 and 1993 so affordable and clean energy is the is this goal that one is committing to and look at where one stand if we look at the top 10 uh countries in terms of consumption uh india is about 1.2% which means that we should have been around 9 or 8% at least if we want to look at the per capita that would indicate a certain quality of life now per capita doesn't mean that the person alone himself or herself is consuming that it's a it's a pro rata which means the industries the transportation the agriculture the cement factories the steel factories the defense the the all other healthcare everything has an electricity footprint and obviously that must be not there a large number of people may not be even having domestic uh, and residential electricity so it shows that we have a long way to go on the bottom right you will see the mix suppose we for a moment forget how much uh, energy one is producing and just look at uh, the bottom right then what do we see uh, you see how much is a fraction produced by coal how much is produced by renewables and so on look at the the orange color bar which is nuclear and you can see uh, these advanced countries like for example france even south korea russia united states have a substantial fraction produced by nuclear india is producing a certain you can see the ratios there blue natural gas and oil <clears throat> primary renewables green if we want to go to several times our existing capacity uh, which is necessary to meet a basic human need a certain quality of human life then everything cannot be multiplied here by a factor of 8 or 4 if we try to do that in coal we would definitely not meet the the sustainability goals there is a need in fact it's already overdue to develop all types of sources in parallel to Uh, coal and natural gas and although the emphasis is going on that we will need to have enough uh, projects which demand power because that is how growth happens and enough resources energy sources 
to fill up that gap. So <clears throat> the next step after ITER, Tober's electricity, will be demo. What will demo do? What needs to be done by demo? First of all, it must demonstrate tritium breeding, a significant tritium breeding. That's how a next step fusion reactor can go all by itself. Once you give it initial charge of say a few kilograms, rest, the, the reactor should be able to generate itself, which means the blankets will not only generate heat, but will also generate tritium. And obviously, once the lithium in the blanket gets over, we will have to find a way of replacing those blankets. So we are dealing with a very strongly radioactive environment there and a mechanism of replacing those blankets. Demonstration of high grade heat, which means a coolant needs to be found, maybe helium or lead lithium or some other water, for example, and select that coolant for connecting to a steam generator, for example, or some other cycle. So power conversion systems need to be built and they are actively being researched upon. It's connection to grid and stability. <clears throat> Reliability and operational performance, safety demonstration, these will be expected out of demo that can one maintain and replace degraded components? How does one manage rat waste? What will be the life cycle cost, for example? Because we have never calculated the cost of coal, because we never added the cost of cleanup of the environment. In that. So once we do a proper and fair comparison, the fusion energy <coughs> will not lag behind in cost competitiveness. Finally, demo must provide inputs for commercial production and licensing policy. But whatever design we choose, whether it's a small compact reactor demo based on new magnetic materials or a large demo like ITER, we will need a you know, trained human resource in knowledge leveraging and a large number of facilities. And of course, utilization of the spin-offs in the meanwhile. So there are parallel paths, which probably are a topic of uh, another talk by itself, but spherical tokamaks have come up in a very strong way. And you would be very interested in knowing that there are startups like tokamak energy in UK, Commonwealth fusion systems in the US, general fusion in Canada, and a number of other uh, know, uh, companies which are sharing or creating uh, public-private partnership models uh, with research grants and developing compact tokamaks. What has happened is that a new material has emerged on the horizon. These are basically bismuth strontium, strontium uh, magnets or rare earth barium uh, cuprates. Uh, so there are these new magnets are capable of going to high temperatures are staying at high temperatures and do not require this excruciatingly low temperature liquid helium. And therefore they can save a tremendous amount of cost. Secondly, such magnets are capable of creating joints, which means we can create magnetic coils which can be opened, unlike what we have today. If you can open the magnetic coils easily, we can pull out the vessel we can do whatever we want. We can improve dramatically the maintenance schemes or reassembly schemes. A whole world opens if we can find these new magnets in operation and they are coming up in operations. They are going to very high fields and they are quite flexible. So a new path is opening and this is due to material science. There are other geometries like stellarators which, uh, which one can read, but these geometries are also exciting because since they don't require current, a whole lot of headache of driving current is gone. Of course, there's some other headache which will come in, in place, but this thing is going pretty strong and we expect good results from stellarators in the coming 10 years. And of course, there are a number of other ways of doing fusion and other paths. So these paths are, are being actively pursued and what one needs is a research on fusion energy with a lot of young people 
uh, industry and institutes joining together, which means university, industry and institutes joining together on a common platform for a multidisciplinary advanced technology science. So plasma physics, neutronics, material science and metallurgy, as you saw for the radiation damage of materials or superconducting materials. Tritium technologies, those elusive things which escape detection or which are so easily absorbed by a whole lot of material that it is very hard to catch them and store them. We need new technologies for that. Radio frequency waves for heating, energetic beams for heating as well as current drive, cryogenics uh, at high temperatures, robotics and remote handling for uh, handling the hot or radioactive objects, massively parallel computing for understanding turbulence and transport in plasmas, artificial intelligence in data analysis in detecting those early warning signs, maybe augmented reality for interface handling and complexity so that you can quickly build X-step reactors for digital manufacturing, for example. High tech, high capacity test facilities are needed or they should be usable. So around the world, this new storm is going to take place as soon as the ITER test facilities become empty and people will fill in. So you as young scientists have to now grab these opportunities in terms of various ways to join all those efforts. So do contribute. I have put in here uh, some references uh, and you can get a lot of interesting material on ITER site itself. So I thank you and I hand over to Dr. Satyanarayan. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Sushir. That is uh, really a fantastic talk. Uh, very beautifully kind of paced, uh, you know, bringing in very pedagogically, like, uh, you know, from the very basics of fusion and, uh, you know, explaining very beautifully the physics of it. And of course, you naturally, I mean, India is a major player, uh, as you said, almost, uh, you know, major components to a level of 10% is actually done by India and Indian industry and scientists. And uh, also bringing into the insights about what is, uh, you know, just after achieving this uh, goal, uh, now how do you actually get to the next phase of uh, uh, the eater and what are the you know main opportunities for not industries alone but also maybe the future businesses and yes. last but not least how the uh, the young generation have a fantastic uh, kind of opportunities at hand and it is no doubt you know often one hears in the context of eater that uh, probably this is one of the biggest challenges for the for our civilization I mean, it really shows what uh, the size and the scale and the consequence of this is going to be uh, for providing absolutely clean and safe and absolutely nearly unlimited uh, you know amount of energy uh, so it's a huge huge uh, i think uh, challenge yeah but uh, i think something but better. light at the end of the tunnel also yeah, of course <laughs> at the end. so uh, of course we are not complaining but the uh, the talk is, uh, I mean, thank you for taking that uh, time uh, to kind of bring out the complete essence of uh, the project. Uh, we have actually quite a few interesting questions from YouTube in particular. I'm not really sure. Uh, maybe uh, if you can uh, bring a very crisp and short answers, we can cover probably all of them. And uh, I want to say that these are all from young people. So, uh, very good. You must I'll be interested. I don't know how to see them on the screen, but you can read out. Yeah, yeah, but these are uh, from YouTube. Uh, so let me very quickly start reading. And uh, uh, so this is Abhinav Chaudhary. What is the theory of runaway electrons in uh, Tokamax and how it is mitigated in ETA? Oh, this is a very, very interesting and very uh, good question. In fact, runaway electrons are. Uh, owe their, um, their theoretical origin to astrophysics. Uh, if we look at Chandrasekhar's paper, uh, the runaway of a star from a globular cluster follows the same thing as runaway of an electron in a plasma. But uh, to make the long uh, thing short, it is simply if the electron scattering cross-section goes on decreasing, which it does 
as a function of energy on upon energy square what happens is that an acceleration causes the energy to increase as a result the mean three path increases increase mean three path causes even more increase of mean three path and therefore it becomes a runaway so an electron then becomes practically collision less and becomes extremely energetic which can cause a beam of energetic electrons of the order of few mev to hit a vessel in a specific area because of the magnetic focusing and it has actually happened in some reactors there was actually a almost a hole was drilled by the uh, runaway electron beams for iter this is being tackled by a very simple method by injecting a massive amount of gas or by shattering pellets of deuterium into the chamber so you suddenly increase the collisionality and prevent the runaway okay uh, another one why the electron cloud is not considered in the calculation of nuclear potential well uh, the when the ions are uh, getting as close to each other uh, especially we we dealt with only the bare ions that is deuterium tritium because they had only one electron but the question is very perfectly placed and for uh, multiply charged uh, uh, elements fusing together the bound electrons do introduce a screening potential and to that extent it actually helps because it doesn't let the other ion know uh how far the other guy has come so uh it is it assists in fusion in some sense these cross sections are also available uh for partially ionized uh, ions fusing together uh, but we dealt with only d and t that's why uh maybe a last uh, one more question from abhinav so uh, is the fusion of quarks is also possible and if yes how much energy may uh, it may generate that might be a difficult question to answer because we do not know how does the quark gluon plasma actually behave there are a number of papers on that and i admit that i am not the expert on that but uh, yes uh, the the when things get that close uh, the quarks Uh, which carry charge and the gluons which incidentally also carry charge and not just one charge electrostatic charge but all other color charges too it becomes a pretty heady mixture and i think that it is better to address it from the point of view of plasma rather than um, uh, from the point of view of binding energy uh, and so on because they have a different behavior they have a symptotic freedom so it's not the same as uh, you know getting two protons and a neutron together and releasing energy i do see a question from dr suresh kumar uh, in uh, on the zoom maybe let us take that and then uh, we still have uh, quite interesting questions on youtube we'll come back uh, if you can do a good job of speeding up yes yeah, suresh uh, can you please yeah it is a very nice uh, imagination or question that uh, quark fusion okay but first of all whether we get uh, quark free quark or to generate the quark we require lot of energy right so, <laughs> again fusing fusing is not problem once you generate quark is so in, strongly interacting it will fuse but uh, from where you will get the quark plasma Correct. I think that's only okay. momentarily obtained only in the CERN collider set. Yeah, that's. Yeah. Right. I think Suresh, uh, we well taken your uh, your comment and sort of to this question. No, but imagination is good. Uh, yeah, yeah, one yeah. should think about thing <laughs> such type. Of thing. <laughs> okay. uh, so let me uh, go quickly to a few more questions from Watsal Trivedi. Uh, what is the Bram stalling and how does it affect the D helium three reaction? bremsstrahlung uh, literally is a german word for breaking radiation which means when you put breaks on a 
on a charged particle it emits radiation uh, it's a it's a simple uh, uh, you can consider in the electromagnetic theory that an accelerated particle uh, emits uh, radiation or similarly a decelerated particle too emits radiation so basically it is just the uh, loss of uh, its kinetic energy happening via uh, radiation by the emission of radiation now the ways by which an electron decelerates is either it is coming or deflecting uh, by an impurity iron for example or it is uh, hit a metal and just suddenly decelerated so it can emit both continuum as well as uh, characteristic x rays so uh, in general for uh, the plasmas of the order of say hundreds of ev we can have a range from you know far infrared uh, and uh, microwave uh, range of spectrum emitting these x rays and <clears throat> i think that uh, as far as the dhe3 is concerned the big issue there is that when we heat the deuterium and the helium 3 ions to say 400 kev and so on they themselves start uh, radiating so much that it is not possible to expect uh, them to uh, create fusion the loss of power due to radiation is far too and almost uh, outperforming what we have tried to gain by fusion so the problem with dhe3 is the high temperatures has nothing to do with dhe3 per se but anything at that temperature would emit a terrific amount of synchrotron and other radiation uh another question can you please elaborate a little on this slide title thermonuclear uh i think i don't remember the uh, slide uh, one of the initial slides but i don't know exactly what is the question but he says uh this thermonuclear fusion this uh, yeah, but Uh, I can't give you more uh, input on this because this is a YouTube question. Um, maybe what we can do is uh, there are a couple of more questions from him. Let let us take that first. Uh, it says uh, in a given magnetic field, uh, due to a difference in their mass, D and T uh, have different major and minor radii, and they will be uh, different torus. So does the collision still happen effectively? Uh, yes. there is a uh, probably a um, clarification we should take the major and the minor radius relate to the device which is the big big yeah. vessel whereas the d and t radius is what is called the larmer radius which uh, we i think this is probably the slide uh, we can use so for a kilo electron volt deuteron we had said it's about 3.3 mm which means the orbit of a deuteron around the magnetic field would be 3.2 mm uh, radius a, a triton would be a little bigger than that i think the question is that how does a bigger radius orbit collide with a smaller radius orbit but uh, it's not just they are not just in one plane they are flowing freely and mm -hmm. coming from different field lines so they can collide anyway Uh, the, their mass or their radius does not matter what here we are saying is that we you can imagine the the particle to be sticking to the field line within that radius uh, what is the what is meant by the internal consistency of the plasma okay internal consistency um i'll have to um i guess i'll have to show a picture um give me a second okay <clears throat> i'll uh, if you do, i'll going to close this 
Uh, there is a question about this slide. So maybe you can finish that. Could you please explain the 2D plot at Aditya slide? Uh, which plot? 2D plot. Ah, on the Aditya uh, reactor. Yeah. Okay. You mean his, this? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, this is Aditya. Here, uh, what you are seeing is the camera which is looking at the vessel and the light emitted by the vessel is emitted by the plasma's interaction with the vessel. So you don't see the vessel, you see only the illuminated bottom lines there. But they are actually, if you look at the top picture, which is a drawing, which shows that the toroidal vessel, which is open from your side, you can see the interior of the vessel and its ports. You are seeing that the plasma is interacting with those circular rings. Mm -hmm. And on the right hand side, you will see a grid and a drawing, yes. uh, which is basically the model. So this is the physics model of the plasma, which shows that these are the magnetic surfaces. And some surface has got in touch with the vessel here at the blue point. This way the plasma and the vessel are interacting and light is emitted in the visible range from those spots. So what the model is predicting is that the lower part of the vessel is interacting with the plasma and upper part is not interacting so much. So model is explaining why you see more light at the bottom than at the top of the vessel. Mm -hmm. The previous question on profile consistency is, uh, uh, I won't be able to answer that uh, okay. right away fully, but what it says is that uh, a number of devices, when you plot the profile of temperature uh, in the plasma as a function of a normalized radius, you will see almost all of them falling onto each other, which means that there is a dimensionless variable, a dimensionless radial variable, which is so innate to the plasma that plasma likes to have a certain profile on that in a certain way. Let's say something like e to the minus x square, let us say. Now, this x is basically a dimensionless variable, which means for a different device, you can find its value based on its length and size and current and so on. And when you plot, no matter what device is, the profile comes out to be same. That was called the profile consistency principle, uh, first proposed by uh, Jack Connor, Jim Hestie, and Brian Taylor long ago. And I find that it's bit advanced, but perhaps one can, an interested student can, uh, we can follow up, you know, into depth with that. It's a good question though. Very nice. Yeah, that was from Sadasu Sahu. And uh, the last one is from Dhruv Mulmuli. Uh, it's an, also an interesting question. So let me read out uh, this for you. China and South Korea have, uh, just a minute, um, have, Many pop-ups coming up, so yeah. China and South Korea have claimed sun-like sustained plasmas for a few tens of seconds. Uh, how significant is such a demo and whether the values of their other plasma parameters good enough to generate power? So that's the next question to end oh, on. This is, a, this is an absolutely fabulous question. Yes, you are you are very right. Of, although uh, the, the China and the Korea uh, tokomax have achieved uh, a long pulse. Uh, uh, remember that uh, uh, there was this heptagon which has to be satisfied <clears throat> uh, where one may achieve one item at a time, which is of course uh, by no means a small achievement because uh, uh, they have much bigger devices and they have certainly much higher temperature. Had they been operating with deuterium tritium, they would have certainly seen a, a certain amount of fusion power. But this is still not uh, 
the the reactor grade because one has to have uh, first of all higher temperatures and higher density uh, to to get to that stage and that requires a significant amount of plasma heating uh, with these devices uh, we saw that especially when they are less than smaller than eater the amount of power they are going to take to reach that temperature is quite significant because the confinement time for these devices is not going to be large it's not going to be even as large as jet so uh, if they had to achieve nt tau greater than 40 they will have to really really go to extremely high temperatures so so great so i think on that note uh, this is probably one of the longest lectures that i have hosted in this series <laughs> i'm sorry for that no absolutely now on the other on the other hand uh, you know it's very delightful i mean that uh, there very very interesting questions that came from uh, many young participants from youtube you have generated enough uh, i would say interest and inspiration to people obviously the project is something which also uh, commands uh, such a such a great uh, interest and uh, thanks again to all the youtube uh, participants and also participants on the zoom and thanks very much indeed on behalf of all of us here uh, to very beautifully uh, it was yes. a pleasure uh so all the best to you and your all the colleagues at uh, all the collaborating institutes in india and also of course abroad and i hope uh, the clean energy and the big system uh, that is going to produce this in future is going to be a reality and all the best for your efforts and uh, all the best with uh, you know what goes on uh, both in ipr and elsewhere thank you thank you very much thank you thank you very much bye